Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome back to Lighthouse Baptist Church. So glad you decided to join us for our morning services. Sorry, we're getting started a little late, had some technical problems, but we're glad to be able to bring the Word of God to you this morning. I want to thank everybody for your continued support, uh, for those that continue to be a part of the RU program, and for reaching out uh, to our nursing home, the gardens. Uh, they made comments and just appreciated uh, us noting them and the things that they're receiving. So we thank you for uh, thinking of them, and if you want to continue to send cards and uh, pictures and letters to the folks again at the gardens at 741 Chambersburg Road, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania 17325. Amen. All right, well, uh, a couple things. Still got the virtual Walk for Life for Tender Care coming up. So if you'd like to be a part of that, go to tendercare.org and check out that information and see uh, how you can get involved. You want to reach out to them. There's plenty of information about that. Uh, the spring banquet that they had scheduled has been postponed to July, so you want to also note that. You're going to need a ticket for that event. Again, log on to their website for more information. Uh, we've got uh, just a number of things. I know that uh, people are postponing and moving around, so be sure to check back uh, in with us if you're concerned about things or questions about events that would have been happening here. Uh, obviously, BBS is on the horizon and some other things like that. We haven't made any determinations yet. And so we're just hoping and praying that the Lord uh, would bless, that the uh, infections would continue to go down, and that folks would be able to open up here in our state, we'd be able to get back in the house of worship. Uh, but again, at any time, if you have any questions about anything, please feel free to send us an email, lighthousebaptist17325 at gmail.com. You can also call us at 717-334-6983. All right, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Pastor Bob Gray. Amen. All right, thank you, Jeremy. I appreciate that. And I want to uh, welcome everybody to the services here this morning. And uh, hope everybody has had a good week. I know it's not easy in the days in which we live, but we have a God that's still on the throne and prayer changes things. Amen. And so we'll just keep, keep looking to him. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll get into the Word of God. Dear Heavenly Father, we just humbly come before you this morning. We thank you, Lord, for who you are and what you do, Lord. We thank you that even in the midst of this virus, there is the sovereignty of God, that you're watching over us, that you're taking care of us, and that, Father, you're allowing uh, things to transpire for whatever reason. It's transpiring under your control, and we thank you that we have a God that's in absolute control of everything. Lord, I pray that you will fill me with the Holy Ghost and with power, that you will speak through me, Lord. You speak to every heart that's listening here this morning, that you, Father, would uh, somehow, Lord, speak to the depths of their soul. Give them some encouragement and strength, and I pray that even in the message, they would find some encouraging words that would help them throughout the week to come. So we thank you now for this time together, Lord, in Jesus' most precious and holy name, I pray, Amen. All right, now, like I do every Sunday, we'll take the Word of God. Repeat after me. I believe that this is the Word of God. I believe that every Word of God is true because it's impossible for God to lie. Amen. So now we're ready to take a look at the Word of God because what that last part is impossible for God to lie. Everything we read in the Bible is absolutely true and trustworthy. And that's going to be important for this uh, message this morning that you understand that. Now, we're, we're going to primarily be in Hebrews 12, uh, verses 25 through uh, 27, primarily. We're going to take a look at some other verses also. I titled the message, Can You Feel the Tremors? Can You Feel the Tremors? Um, as of yet in my life, I have never felt a, a full-fledged earthquake. I've never been in a full earthquake actual happening. But a couple of times I have experienced tremors, uh, those tremors that earthquakes that you get with earthquakes. One time I was in Bible college and of all places, I went to Bible college up in Boston and I was working security. I was in the security office and I just had this strange feeling like something was moving. I, I looked at the wall and the, and the clipboards were swinging back and forth and I assume well, maybe the racquetball courts on the other side of the office, maybe somebody hit the wall real hard, but it was just a strange sensation. Uh, it wasn't too long after that, uh, within minutes, somebody was calling me on the radio and said, hey, did you feel that? And that was a, a tremor. Uh, another time was right here in Gettysburg, and I happened to be at home at the time, 
and uh, I was sitting in, the, in my chair in my living room and I just felt like things were moving. Now I live in a, a double wide mobile home so when you get that feeling it's not too comfortable. You begin to think, man, is the trailer sliding? What's going on here? And it turned out that that was a tremor. Now you guys probably remember uh, that was so bad. It happened down uh, toward Virginia, down that way, but it had uh, destroyed, not destroyed, but it had gave uh, structural damage to the uh, Washington Monument. And uh, that had far reaching effects, that tremor. Well, we're gonna read here some verses about shaking, about God shaking things. And I believe right now we're feeling the tremors, but God is doing the shaking. And it's important for us to understand that. Uh, and in Hebrews, to get the fuller context, and I'm going to, I'm, maybe I'm reading a lot of verses here, but just to get the fuller context, let's start reading in verse number 18. And in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18, the word of God says, For you are not come unto the mount that might be touched, that burneth with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that it would that it would that, that the that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. For they could not endure that which was commanded, and if so, if so much as a beast touch the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with the dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. Now those verses real quickly, that's when they came out of uh, the Exodus, they came out of Egypt, they're on Mount Sinai, and God appears to Moses on the mountain. It was an incredible event, the whole mountain, everything shook. The people did not want to hear the voice of God. They said, Moses, you tell us what God has to say. It was that frightening. Now, verse 22 talks about another mountain. It's a mountain that under the new covenant that we're part of, and Mount Zion, the new Jerusalem. It says in verse 22, But ye are come unto Mount Zion, unto, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven. And to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. So we're under this new covenant. We have this special blessing that's better in every way than the old covenant. Now, he's telling us this stuff in Hebrews because he's laying the foundation for what he's going to say about a shaking in the past and a shaking in the future. So in verse 25, he says, See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, how much more, uh, yeah, yeah, much more shall we, shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And his word yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken as things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. So he talks about this event that happened in the past. He spoke then. He spoke at Mount Sinai. But there's going to be a future time in which he is going to speak again. At Mount, at Mount Sinai, he, he shook the earth. But in his second coming, he's going to shake the earth and the heavens. In fact, the verses that we looked at, verses uh, 26 and 27, he's quoting from Haggai. And let's just look at Haggai real quick. Because primarily what I want to preach to you is more or less the application, but I want you to understand the, the, the context of it before we would get into an application aspect of it. 
In Haggai chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, there the word of God says, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. So the first shaken Mount Sinai, he shook that mountain. The second coming of Christ, he's not only going to shake the land, but the heavens also. But he also talks here about shaking the nations. He says, verse 7, and I will shake all nations and the desire of all nations shall come. The desire of all nations is the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes back. Amen. So we're talking about this future shaking. He says, I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. And that is the Old Testament uh, temple being filled with glory. And the New Testament sense, there is going to be another temple uh, built, and it's going to be filled with the glory of God. All right, now, back in Hebrews chapter uh, uh, 12, when we're talking about these shakings. Now, God is speaking to us today through his word and his providential workings in the world. Let me give that to you again, because this is important for you to understand. God is speaking to us today through his word and his providential workings in the world. In other words, he speaks to us through, this, through his word, and he works through the government and affairs of men. And we need to realize that God is sovereign, that, that things happen for a purpose. And even though on the surface it doesn't seem good to us, God always, throughout, and this is true throughout the whole word of God, he always takes these negative things and, has been, and is able to use them for good in a positive way. There's example after example, and it's the providential workings of God. And so we need to learn to trust God. We need to learn to rely on him. We need to learn to listen to him. Because when things start happening in our circumstances and things are happening around us, God is speaking, and we need to ask ourselves, what is he saying? What is he saying? What this whole thing with this virus and the uh, problems with the economy and, and a host of other things. What is God saying? What is he trying to tell us? How is he trying to get our attention? Have we been ignoring God? Is this the final setup? Which part of what, what I believe part of what's going on is the entering the, the beginnings of the final stage of things as we know it. In fact, one of the phrases you hear a lot on uh, television right now is the new normal. They keep telling you that because they want to get into your head to accept things. This is the new normal. And folks, I, I'm not a doomsday guy, but everything, the way that you knew life prior to this event, that is none of that is coming back from this time forward. We're going to be living under a, a new thing. And it's not just America. It is the world. In fact, let me give you an example of how things are shaken up globally. Italy, we all heard about Italy and how hard the virus has hit Italy. Well, Italy was the, was the, uh, the fourth, uh, the fourth uh, best economy in the European Union. The biggest, fourth biggest, largest economy in Europe was Italy. It was eight in the world. But because of the virus hitting Italy so hard, economically it's destroying them they they are they are just barely hanging on right now and they're going from one of the best to one of the worst economies now their setup is a little different than ours in america what do we do we just print more money printing more money is never the answer to the problem and i want to tell you why because you don't have money to back it in other words the more money that we print we weaken the dollar the dollar is less in value so say the dollar was only worth 50 cents prior to our economic crisis and we just printed a bunch of money, now it's only worth 25 cents. Now this, I'm giving you simplified figures there, but I want you to understand. So it buys us some time, but it's not the answer. Now in Europe, it's just the opposite. Italy cannot print euros. So they're in serious trouble with the debt. They need about several billion euros right now they need to, to, to sustain just the debt that they have. And so they went from one of the top economies to the worst. So you begin to see how this is working globally to bring us into a, a situation where we're going to need a global economy. Back in 2009, 
uh, G8 summit had met, and with the sanction of the United Nations, they had came up with a new coin. Uh, this coin uh, is called the, uh, the, the the unity and diversity, is what it says on it. Like in ours, it says, in God we trust. And their uh, currency, it was saying unity through diversity. And the thought behind it was that we would someday go to a global currency and that, and that would be a prototype of what the coin would look like. Now, I don't know when this will ever take place, but I do know that there's enough evidence on the horizon that globally, the economy globally cannot sustain what is happening due to the coronavirus outbreak. And so there's a lot that is happening right now. And, and I didn't really want this to be an end times scenario message, but you can see how all this is moving toward what the Bible calls the seven year tribulation period, the rise of a Superman that will rescue the uh, rescue humanity. It's going to be a man that has all the answers. He'll have the answer for the coronavirus. He'll have the answer for the economic disaster. Uh, he'll have a way to unify peoples together. And people already are looking for that to happen all over. People are looking for, for some way to just unify us all so that we can all have a little bit of peace. And it's amazing what man will give up for peace. Now that man that will come on the scene will be known as the Antichrist. And folks, we're moving close. We are moving very, very close. And so we see this shaking that's going on. Now, I wrote some things down here, and I just want to uh, give that to you before we look at some more specific things. If God shook things at Sinai, and those who refused to hear were judged, and that's what the Bible tells us, when he shook things at, not, at Sinai, there were those that they didn't want to hear, and they didn't want to do what God wanted to do, and they ended up suffering judgment. So if God shook things at Sinai, and those who refused to hear were judged, how much more responsible are we today who have experienced the blessings of the new covenant? Folks, we're, we're, we're accountable to God, especially Christians. And in fact, I saw a sign the other day and it said the antidote to the coronavirus is Psalm 91. And I get what they're saying. It's a psalm where, where God promises that he would uh, protect, uh, protect his people uh, from diseases and stuff of that nature. I get that. But to me, the antidote for the coronavirus isn't Psalm 91. It's 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Yes, Christians, we're so worried about the world and what lost people are doing. We need to be worried about what we're doing. We need to turn from our wicked ways. We need to humble ourselves, seek God's face and pray. Amen? And his promise then is that he would hear from heaven he would forgive our sins and get this, heal our land. The antidote, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, and it's up to us, God's people. And we've experienced, we're living under the greatest covenant of all, the new covenant, the new covenant, so much better than the old covenant. And we need to listen to what God's saying. We need to follow his direction. So God today is shaking things and he wants to, tear down the scaffolding, if you will. He wants to tear down the scaffolding and reveal the unshakable re realities that are eternal. He wants to reveal the unshakable realities that are eternal. Too many people, including Christians, are building their lives on things that can shake. And this is what God is doing. He's, he's got to shake things up. Why? So we stop trusting in these things that don't matter, these things that have no real power. And so uh, the shaking quotation that I read to you, it, it comes from Haggai 2.6, and the shaking uh, quotation refers to the time when the Lord shall return and fill this, his house with glory. And as events draw near to that time, we shall see more shaking in this world. But the Christian don't need to be fearful. He needs to be confident. Confident. Amen. Now let's look at those verses again. Let's look at verses uh, 26 and 27 of Hebrews. Of Hebrews. 
And uh, we want to look at some things that are shaken, some things that will remain. They won't, they can't be shaken. And then lastly, we want to look at what shall we do as we live in a shaken world. All right, so uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 26, whose voice then, that's at, back at Mount Sinai, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, as of the things that are made, the things that are created, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. All right, so what can be shaken and move, remove? What can be shaken? Well, man's faith in himself. Man has a pretty high opinion of himself and how he can fix and handle everything. If there's anything we've learned in the past six weeks is, weeks is that there's things that are beyond man's control. Uh, man's faith in himself is a shaken thing, a thing that can be moved. Man's faith in his uh, political plans for the future, shaken. How many candidates in this upcoming election all had plans, uh, but everything changed in a moment, didn't it? Man's uh, political plans can be shaken and removed. Um, all systems of science, philosophy, and education can be shaken and removed. And I think we're seeing that happen before our eyes right now. Uh, science and philosophy, education, and what we thought we knew, we realized, no, we don't know. What we thought we had a handle on, we realize now we don't have a handle on. And things are being shaken and removed. Uh, uh, every conviction, every conviction uh, promoted by the mass media is being shaken. Every conviction, and you've got to be careful, folks. Uh, don't just believe everything you hear on the news. Don't take it as gospel truth. And, and realize we live in a time when through technology we can manipulate sound bites to make people say stuff they really aren't saying or make it sound like they mean something that they don't mean. Uh, we need to exercise some wisdom, and I don't think I need to belabor that point, but it is pretty obvious the news on every level, even local here in Gettysburg, uh, Gettysburg Times. I have read numerous articles where they just did not get the facts right, and they didn't really care about getting the facts right. Uh, we don't live in a day of journalism where people are more concerned about the truth. They're more concerned with forming your opinion. That is not journalism. That's not reporting the news. That is indoctrinating you. This could be my last. This could be my last uh, message, brother. But I'm going to go down telling the truth, amen. And people need to realize this. We we are living in troublesome times. What else can be shaken? Well, man's plans for conquering outer space can be shaken. You know, what do you mean, man's plans for conquering outer space? We went to the moon. We came back. We we did that. We've done that. Not we're not done doing that, folks. You realize that while I'm talking. For a number of years now, uh, we've been putting together a program, uh, I don't know how many much money, probably trillions of dollars, to get man on Mars. That's our next endeavor, to put men on Mars. To me, it's a waste of time and a useless endeavor and a waste of a whole lot of money, amen? But yet, that's what we're doing. We're trying to put man on Mars. But you know what, what does that mean? What does it prove? How has sending men to the moon and sending men to outer space really helped us. Has it really helped us? I'm not opposed to space exploration. I'm not opposed to finding out about our universe and God's creation and the way that he designed it. In fact, as far as I'm concerned, the more we look into these things, the more we realize there is a designer, there is a creator that made this. It couldn't have just happened. There's too many things that are absolutely perfect that that have to happen in order for there to be life. And yet the handprint of God is all over everything. And uh, so I'm not opposed to it, but sometimes I think we need to use wisdom as to why we do certain things. Why are we sending men to Mars? Is that really essential? Is that really important? Well, even uh, man's plans uh, 
uh, for conquering outer, outer space can be shaken. Uh, religious systems of the world can be shaken. And through these hard times, they can be revealed for what they really are. Uh, there's a lot of charlatans in the day in which we live. And I think uh, cases like this really expose people for who they are. Uh, false doctrine that doesn't administer help, help and hope and all this stuff is being exposed. Um, the, uh, the earth, the trees, the mountains, and the seas, all these things can be shaken. And as I speak, they are being shaken. All this physical stuff, the facade, is all being shaken, and it's being shaken by the hand of God. Now, people will go around and they'll tell you, Oh, yeah, Bob, I understand what you're saying, but the, it's the devil that's doing this. He's come to steal, kill, and destroy. And they blame the devil for everything. Now, listen, I believe that the devil's intent is to steal, kill, and destroy. I believe he does that on a mass scale. I believe he's constantly active. But I also believe that he cannot do anything without God's permission. So even the devil is subject to a sovereign God. So even though the devil could have his hand in, in a lot of things that we're seeing happening, and no doubt he does, it's under God's control, amen? He's allowing him to be used in this shaking process. But don't lose heart. God is doing the shaking, and God is in control. In fact, let me, let me get off course here just briefly. When you look at the book of Revelation, a lot of people say, oh, look, look at what the devil's doing. The devil isn't doing anything. God is behind the sealed judgments. It's called the wrath of the Lamb. That's God. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's God who's doing the, the trumpet judgments, the sealed judgments, the, the bowl judgments. This is God's pouring out his wrath upon a rebellious world that he's desperately tried to reach. He desperately has reached out to over and over again. And now we've come to that point in history where these judgments have to take place. And everything that you see in the book of Revelation, all the all, all that's going on, it's, it's orchestrated, orchestra, orchestrated by the hand of God. And there's going to be a purpose and a plan to it. And when you read the book at the end, at the end of the book of Revelation, Jesus comes back, establishes his kingdom, and, and it ends up in a good way. But we have to go through this negative stuff before we get to the good stuff. And right now, we're feeling the beginnings of those things that are shaken to reveal how useless they are to reveal how there's no substance to everything that we're trusting in. There's no substance to that. All right, so what does remain? What does uh, stand and cannot be shaken? Well, he says there in verse 27 again, he says, and this word yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Those things which cannot be shaken may remain. What cannot be shaken? There's three specific things I want to hit on because they're, they're going to be important for your everyday life. But I've got a list of, of eight things that I just want to just go through them real quickly. What cannot be shaken? The grace of God cannot be shaken. God's unmerited favor toward you. His grace, his enabling ability, that can never be shaken. That is firm and sure. God's mercy. What is his mercy? His mercy is, is giving us what we don't deserve. His mercy, his loving kindness. None of that can be shaken. None of that can be altered or changed. In fact, the Bible says nothing can separate us from the love of God. Amen. And he gives a whole list of things. None of these things in Romans 8 can shake and remove God's love, which is the third thing. God's love cannot be shaken. It cannot be removed. Our heavenly home cannot be shaken or removed. Amen? Jesus said, I, he said, in my father's house are what? Many mansions. He says, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there ye may be also. That cannot be taken away. That cannot be shaken and is being built by Jesus himself, my heavenly home. Amen? You can... Uh, throw me in jail, you can take away my health, you can take away my, my home, my vehicle, my clothes, you can take away everything I have, but you can never take away my heavenly home. That cannot be shaken. Amen? This is good stuff. Our salvation cannot be shaken. 
My sin can hinder my fellowship with God, but I can never lose that uh, relationship, Father, Son. He's always going to be my Heavenly Father. I'm always going to be His adopted Son. Amen? And that can never be uh, shaken. I, uh, once again, my personal sin might hinder that, just like uh, your child. Your child is always your child. My sons are always my sons. Now, personal sin could hinder that and our relationship not be all it can be. There could be a little division there, but they'll never stop being my son. It's the same in the spiritual sense. Our salvation stand assured. Amen? And then uh, the last three things are the most important. These last three things are the most important. The credibility and the integrity of God cannot be shaken. The credibility and the integrity of God. And Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8, the Bible tells us Jesus Christ is saying yesterday and today and forever. He changes not. Amen. He is consistent in who he is. And let me tell you, he's consistent in what he feels and thinks about things. So what he wrote in his word of God 4,000 years ago, don't say, well, that's 4,000 years ago. That's old time. No, that's the mind of God who changes not. And he still feels the same way about those things that he addressed 4,000 years ago, about the sense of morality, what's right and what's wrong. Amen? He does not change. He changes not. And he is a God that's in control. He's sovereign. There, there's no other God after him. There's no other God before him. He is the one and the only true God. All that is answers to him and him alone. Now, does he have a kingdom in rebellion right now? Yes, he does. But that rebellion, rebellion is not going to last and that rebellion has not changed the integrity and the character of God. He is still a God of love. He is still a God of justice. He is still a God of mercy. He is still everything he ever claimed to be and so much more. Amen. Amen. You need to understand that as everything around you is being shaken uh, today in your life, as all this stuff is being shaken, God remains the same. He is the constant. He is who you have to go to and look to and cling to and hold on to. He is unshakable. Then the promises of God, the promises of God or the word of God is unshakable. Amen? It's unshakable. Uh, let's look at a couple of verses. Look at, uh, at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 25. Just uh, not too far over from Hebrews there. 1 Peter chapter 1. And notice with me verse number 25. Notice what the Word of God says. Well, 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 we need to back it up. I do this all the time. I say, look at this verse, and then I say, all right, back it up. Because this is too good. This is good stuff, folks. Look at this. Verse 23 says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. The Word of God liveth and abides forever. Not just a little bit, but forever for all flesh is as grass, and all and uh, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. That's the shaking. That stuff can get shaken and fall away. But notice verse twenty-five. But the word of the Lord endureth oh, forever, forever, forever. It, 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 it's never going to be shaken. It's never going to be removed. Every jot and tittle of the word of God will consist forever as long as there's, uh, as there's time and eternity. But the word of God endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Look over in uh, 2 Peter. 2 Peter. And 2 Peter in chapter 1 and verse number 4. Chapter 1 and verse number 4 whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. These promises, they're exceeding, they're great, they're precious promises, they're given unto us, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So we have these precious promises. Then drop down to verse 19 of that same verb, that same chapter there. He is talking about seeing the transfiguration. In fact, let's instead of me describing what he's saying, let's drop back to verse 16 and read forward. And uh, 2 Peter 
chapter 1, verse 16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For we received from God the Father honor and glory where, uh, when there came such a voice to him from the exceed excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mountain. He's talking about the Mount of Transfiguration. But then notice what he says in verse 19. But we have also a more sure word of prophecy. A more sure word of prophecy. And, and, and listen, you, you don't need to rely on experiences. You've got a more sure word of prophecy. The word of God, amen? The word of God is sure. We have a more sure word of prophecy. We're unto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is a private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. Hey, did you see that? How many times have people tell you, oh, that Bible, that's just the old men. That's old men that wrote that a long time ago. They need to read the Bible that they're criticizing because it says that old men had nothing to do with writing in this book. Amen? It says here, it says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved. That word moved literally means to be carried along by the Holy Ghost. Uh, uh, Timothy says all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. It is God breathed. Listen, this word of God is God's pure word. Amen. It is sure. It is steadfast. It is never changing. It is unmovable. Every jot, every tittle. It'll be good forever and ever and ever. It's unshakable. Listen, if you go to television and you go to the news, you're going to look at sifting sand. You're going to get various reports. You're going to have people changing their, their mind about things every five seconds. But when you come to the Word of God, it is a sure foundation that you can anchor your heart and your life in. Amen? So we've got this incredible, unchanging God. we got this incredible, unchanging Word. And we got this incredible, unchanging, unshakable kingdom to come. Notice back in Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12 and verse 28, it says, Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. We receiving a kingdom. Receiving means it hasn't come yet, but it is coming. We're receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, which cannot be shaken. The kingdom of God cannot be shaken. The kingdoms of this world can be shaken. They are being shaken and they will be shaken. But the kingdom of God will never be shaken. And that's the kingdom that you belong to. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior. If you put your faith and trust in him. If you see him dying on an old rugged cross. Paying the penalty. Suffering for your sin. Dying for it. Bearing the wrath of God upon himself. And you look at that cross and you say, God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. God, forgive me, not based on any good thing I can muster up, but purely on what you have done. God, forgive me. God, forgive me. And that moment, folks, your sins are white, washed away. Though they were uh, a scarlet, they will be made white as snow. Every sin, past, present, and future, all gone. Amen. As far as the east is from the west, buried in the depths of the deep blue sea, thrown over the back of God, never to be remembered no more. Amen. But you got to come believing that he died for your sins and that he rose again on the third day and put your faith and trust in him. And that's how you become part of this kingdom, this unshakable, unmoving kingdom of God. Now, let me be real quick because I need to give you some practical advice in this message as we face the upcoming week. What shall we do as we live in a shaking world? And the world is shaking. And folks, it's, this is just the tremors. The real shaking hasn't even begun yet. Now, that might not sound pleasing to you, but I'm not here to please. We're here to tell the truth. Amen? The real shaking hasn't come yet. Just the tremors. But what's going to get us through? 
Well, first of all, we need to listen to God speak and obey him. In that Hebrews 12 passage in verse 25, he says, See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, how much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven? Listen, what did they do? When he spoke in Mount Sinai, they refused him. They rejected him. Forty years in the wilderness wandering, they'd given God a hard time not believing him, not listening to him, not wanting him or his man to reign over them. They suffered judgment. They suffered the judgment of God. Now, the Bible tells us that the things in the Old Testament are there for our example and our learning. If we still turn away from him, if we still refuse to listen to him, guess what? We're in trouble. We're bringing judgment upon ourselves. And folks, I've heard local, uh, not local, but politicians in general on, on world news and on the news in general make comments about God heaping judgment upon themselves. Folks, we need to be careful. We need to not fight and argue and question God. We need to listen to what he's saying and obey it. Amen? And that's what gets us through the shaking is listening to God listening to God. A second thing is do not be distracted. Oh, no, excuse me. Uh, a second thing is receive grace day by day to serve God. Receive grace day by day to serve God. You notice that in uh, uh, verse number 28 of Hebrews 12, he says, wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God. Let us have grace. In other words, we, we need this grace of God so that we can serve God. There's three aspects to serving God. Acceptably, listen, not everything that we do, we, we claim, um, I'm serving God. Not every time you say that means that God's accepting what you're doing. We need to learn to serve God acceptably. Notice what else he says, with reverence and godly fear. Reverence and godly fear. What's reverence? Reverence is an awe of who God is. He's the almighty God. We've got this uh, thought in our country, even amongst Christians, that he's just my best friend. He's my, 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 the guy in the sky. That he just answer all your prayers. Just do whatever you want. He's a big, he's a grandpa. He's a Santa Claus. He just do whatever. He never say anything mean or nasty or, or ever be hard or hurt anybody. All oh, that's a bunch of lies, folks. God is God. He is holy and he is separate from sinners. He is different from us in every way. And we need to recognize that. We need to humble ourselves in reverence and awe of who he is. Awe of the fact that he spoke this whole world into existence and that quick he can speak it out of existence. And then it says godly fear. Godly fear. fear, fear be afraid of God. Amen. Now, it's a godly fear, not a perverted fear, not walking on eggshells type of fear. But uh, put it this way, perhaps uh, uh, you could use the illustration of maybe your, your, your dad. Uh, you didn't want to cross the line with your dad because you knew you were going to get it. Amen? I feared my dad's discipline. That doesn't mean I was afraid of my dad, but I feared his discipline. He wasn't afraid to, to give me a spanking. Now, I know today that's child abuse. Uh, the Bible says, he that spareth the rod. Oh, you misquoted it. You misquoted it because you said, he that spareth the rod. Uh, what, what's the world say? He that spareth the rod. Uh, yeah, that's what God says. God, God says, he that spareth the rod hated his child. Hated his child. We weaken that. We say something else. I can't remember what the world says, and that's all right because... Why do I want to remember what the world says? But the world puts a, a spin on that, and it lessens what God's word says. Amen? Uh, I can't remember what it is. I, I always know it, and now I can't remember it. Oh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. What God says is, if you love your child, you're going to what? You're going to discipline your child. You're going to discipline. You're, the rod is a discipline. Amen? Um, I say this all the time in our congregation. Now I'm probably getting in trouble, right? Hey, why is your back end... Cushiony. Why is that so soft back there? That's where God designed to apply the rod. That's where you give spankings. You don't give spankings across the face or on the side or anywhere else. 
you'll get spankings right there on the butt because that's what it's made for. The rod of correction applied in the right way will produce the right results. Amen? And, uh, and I was afraid. I do not want to get a spanking. Amen? I wasn't afraid of my dad, but I was afraid of his discipline. This is the problem with most people today. They're not afraid of God. There's no fear of God in their heart. They don't care that they'll have to answer to God for what they do. In fact, they don't even think they're going to answer to God. They just think it's just everybody dies, everybody goes to heaven, it's a big old jolly party. But that's not what the Bible teaches, amen? Listen, we need to uh, receive grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. A third thing is that we're not to be distracted or frightened by the tremendous changes going on around you. Do not be distracted or frightened by the tremendous changes going on around you. Notice in Hebrews 13 verses 5 and 6, let not your conversation, which means your lifestyle, be without, be, uh, let Excuse me, let your conversation or your lifestyle be without covetousness. That's greed. Saying, I need this, I need that, I want that. And be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. I'm not going to fear what man shall do unto me. Why? Because God's in control. God is with me. God is in charge. Amen. And I'm to be content with whatever I have, whether it's much or whether it's little, be content with it. Don't be distracted or frightened by the tremendous changes going on around you. And folks, I'm not a prophet, no, the son of a prophet, but the changes you just seen the beginning of the changes that are going to happen in our nation, don't let it frighten you. Just be aware that it's coming. And then uh, uh, lastly, uh, uh, well, two more things. Uh, number four, uh, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Uh, he, Hebrews 12, 1 talks about that. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which does so easily beset us, knock us off course. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. We need to run with patience. Be patient throughout this next week. Run your race that, that what God has for you to do, that's what you need to be preoccupied with. Amen? Run your race and do it with patience. Don't think that you, everything just has to turn out just, man, just spectacular right away. Just have patience. It, it will, and it's time. Things will work out. But run with patience. And then lastly, and most importantly, keep looking unto Jesus. Verse 12, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. The most important thing we have to do this week is to keep looking unto Jesus. I'm putting together this little notebook I have of all these little things that I'm learning from my puppy. Now, my wife was diagnosed with cancer in uh, December, and she had to undergo uh, these treatments. And I felt that, uh, I really felt like the Lord was leading me to get her a, a puppy because I heard that they're, they're therapeutic. And I thought it would be a help to her if I got her this puppy. And let me tell you, it's therapeutic, all right? She loves the dog and I need therapy. <laughs> You'll catch on to that. That's a bad thing with live streaming in an empty auditorium. Nobody's to laugh, there to laugh at your dumb jokes. But, uh, but, you know, I started writing in a notebook the things that God was teaching me through this puppy. And one of the last things I put in the notebook, was I, I called it, I titled it Attention. Because you know what that puppy does? That puppy follows me everywhere I go. Everywhere I go. I get up, I go, and he, he follows me. Everywhere. Yeah, yesterday, we, we had him here at the church. I came over here, checked the mail. I want to do a little bit of study, and I had him over here at the church with me. Pamela was with me. My granddaughter was with me. And when we were leaving, he, he didn't want to leave until he knew I was leaving with him. He, that's, he just wants to be by me. And he'll sit there at my feet. He'll lay there for hours, just lay at my feet. He'll sit there, and he'll look at me, and he's waiting for me to respond to him. 
He's waiting for me to give him something. Sometimes if I'm eating, so he, want, he wants it. He wants to try to get something. And he just stays by me all the time. This is how we're supposed to be with Jesus. Just like that puppy. Maybe you have a dog that does the same thing. They just, they look at you. They just constantly focus on you. And folks, that's how we need to be with Jesus. We need to focus on Jesus. We need to be at his feet. We need to be ready and willing to do whatever he wants to do. When I, I said, hey, I said, hey, boy, you want to go out? Ready to go out? And he gets excited. He stands up and I put the leash on him. We take him out. And we need to be that way with God. God may be saying, hey, hey, boy, I, I want you to do this for me. I, I want you to do this with me. I want you to go talk to that person. I want you to make this phone call. Uh, I want you to spend some time in my work. We need to be willing to do it, to take up and do whatever the master wants us to do, just like our pets, amen, with their complete attention on, on the Lord, the same way that puppy puts his full attention on me. That will get you through this week more than anything else, keeping your eyes on Jesus. So, so what shall we do as we live in a shaken world? Listen to God and speak. Uh, listen to God speak and obey Him. Receive grace whereby we may serve God acceptably. Uh, do not be distracted or frightened by the tremendous changes going on around you. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us and keep looking unto Jesus. Listen, folks, while others are being frightened and falling apart around you, there is there's a lot of people out there, they're scared, and they're frightened, and they're not sure where all this is going to end. And I'm not belittling them feeling that way, so please don't think so. But I know this, as far as the Christian goes, that's not how we ought to feel. We ought to have confidence, confidence in our God, confidence that he's using this for an ultimate good, though we don't understand why. He's using it for his ultimate purpose and good. Perhaps this is setting up the final stages before the tribulation period and the second coming of Christ. Perhaps it is. We don't know for sure. We won't know until we see how things play out. But as Christians, regardless if the tribulation is on the horizon or it's a hundred years off, for Christians, we are to have confidence in our God, knowing that he does all things well. He makes no mistakes. And uh, we just need to rely and trust in him. Amen. So brothers and sisters in Christ, please do that. Please put your full weight of confidence on him. And if you're out there and you're hearing this and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, oh, I'm pleading with you. I'm pleading with you. Trust him. Listen, we're not guaranteed another moment. I said that right, another moment. The Bible says there's one step between me and death. And it doesn't matter how old you are. Young people die as well as older people. And in that quick, you can enter eternity that is far worse, far worse than anything you're experiencing here on earth. And you need to know Christ as your Savior. That's the only way to escape that. Hell is a just reward for those who despise the sacrifice of Christ. Why? Because once you despise the sacrifice of Christ, you've taken away the payment for your sin. You have no payment. You have no payment. You're in trouble. Amen. How are you going to cover your sin? All our sin, because you're the glory of God. There's a sin debt. How are you going to cover that? You need to trust Christ. So I'll encourage you to just bow your head and say, Lord, I believe that you died for me. I believe that you rose again on the third day. I believe that everything you suffered on the cross, you suffered for me. And Lord, I'm not trusting myself, my religion, or my works. I'm just trusting what you did. And I'm asking you, Lord, to forgive me of my sin and to give me this new life. Please pray something like that and let us know if you do. And also, if you have any other questions, you can email or call the church. And we'd like to be a help to you so that when you die, you will know 100% sure that you're going to heaven. And it's not an if you die, it's a when. It's a when. So don't leave this life without knowing where you're going. Amen. Well, we thank you for this time together. We'll be back again at 7 as we're studying through Luke, the Gospel of Luke. We're in chapter 18. As I say every week, if you can't win a soul, touch a heart. A, lot, a day in which a lot of hearts need touched. Amen. And keep looking up. Why? Our redemption draweth nigh. Well, you have a, a, a blessed day, and we'll see you around. Bye.